sponsored by the World Painter Congress. And the first slide here just shows you um, the details of our next Congress being held in Dublin, Ireland, and the 30th of May to the 2nd of June of 2022. And we trust that the COVID pandemic will be over by then, and we can all come and enjoy uh, Ireland, one of the original places where potato was a very important crop. And of course, we know the history of what happened with the, the famine, with the late blight. So we we're fortunate to go from Cusco and Peru, the last one, to now to uh, Dublin, Ireland to see potato work being done there and also hear each other talk and share our stories from around the world. So it's a great opportunity to be together in Dublin coming next 2022. So today I've been asked to talk about aeroponics. I'm a farmer now in Canada, but previously to that I worked with the International Potato Center, both in Africa and in Asia. I have spent a good deal of time also working in China with colleagues there since 1986. And through all of this, we have come to the point of the, during the last 13 years of also developing aeroponics. I'm very fortunate to have with my co-authors today, uh, Dr. He Wei and Dr. Wang Ke Shu from the Academy of Agriculture Sciences in Chengdu as well as uh, Gao Jian, who's a commercial operator in Yunnan province of the aeroponics business, as well as Andre Lachance, who is my colleague here in Canada, who has his own business as well, doing aeroponics. So th this presentation is really, I'm the one who's speaking, but all of us have contributed to this presentation and I want to give them full credit for the contribution. And if I guess there's any criticism, please pass it to me. So the main point of this talk is, and I think this is important to remember, I think of this audience today of about 500 people, I would guess 400 of you are, are interested to know what's happening, what's, what this is all about, and about 100 of you are probably actively involved in aeroponics work today. So with that background, I'm making this presentation more of an overview, history, what's happening, and what are the future challenges with this technology. Let's give a bit of history. NASA, the space program for the United States with many countries collaborating, of course, the big goal is to have people go out into space, whether it's on Mars or other planets, to live. And how do you grow food in space? And this has been a major thrust of NASA with different universities in the United States and around the world. And this started with Ernest around 1985. And I want to explain to you first that soils are too heavy to transport. Of course, there are soils on, on planet Mars, for example, that could be possibly used. But so aeroponics is one way of looking at how we can grow potatoes and other crops in space. Now this contrasts to hydroponics. Hydroponics is probably more well known by many people. Hydroponics is when the roots of a plant always are in a flowing solution that nourishes the plant. With aeroponics, it is simply the plants are in air and the plants are misted. This is the a big difference. Now, I want to, it was very interesting in 1988, we organized the Asia Potato Association Triennial Conference in Kunming, China. At that conference, Dr. Wang, Professor Wang Jun was one of the co-organizers with me at that conference. John Niederhauser, who was then working in Arizona at Tucson for the space program, gave a talk on potatoes growing in space. And it was really amazing, it's 1988 when he spoke at that conference in Kunming. And to see how that has evolved since then, John is no longer living, but the, the, the amazing story of how his presentation there in Kunming has sort of sparked also this interest in aeroponics. Let's now move forward to 2008. And Sichuan experienced a very tragic earthquake. It was a major event that destroyed a lot of the landscapes. Potato fields were destroyed. This is the home of potatoes as well, as besides the Andes of Peru and the Himalayan mountains of, of China. 
And this earthquake was so devastating that the International Potato Center, along with the World Bank, chose a strategy of using aeroponics to replenish the seed supply of the farmers who lost their, their potatoes during this earthquake. This started in 2000, this happened in 2008. So out of this tragedy, with different partners coming together, the World Bank with the funding, SIP, Chinese scientists together, came together to start this process of doing aeroponics as a rapid way to produce seed potatoes for the farmers stricken by the earthquake. The Sichuan Academy of Agricultural Sciences was chosen as a lead institution for this work, along with the International Potato Center support, and Dr. He Wei and Dr. Che Kaiyun were instrumental in developing the aeroponics system. This picture here is taken in 2010. By that time, they had already established it well and producing many tubers, many tubers in this way. A very simple technique, but at least you can see from the picture here that this is working, was established and was massively producing many tubers for the people who needed it in the mountains of Sichuan province and even beyond in Yunnan province and other places as well. Along with this time when this work was being done at Sichuan, the International Hospital Center did the same research work in Lima. I saw it being developed there when I was on the board of trustees of SIP. From there, it spread to parts of East Africa. And other parts of the world also started to adopt and experiment with aeroponics. But this is all basically at the demonstration level and experimental level in, in the other countries. But in China, it took a different approach. I want to honor um, my colleague, Dr. Shei Kaiyun. Shei Kaiyun was really the, the, the instrumental in moving this program forward. And he, was, he worked for SIP in China. And he was a strong, physio, was strong on the physiology side of, the, of, the, of how to do this and really pushed this hard within the Chinese government levels at all levels, as well as internationally through SIP. Unfortunately, Dr. Kaiyun uh, has passed away very prematurely. He was full of energy and did a wonderful job and he's sorely missed. He was truly a champion for the work on aeroponics in China and I would say globally. And a dear friend at that too. In China, what happened then was with the aeroponics being quite successful at the demonstration level, the government through the encouragement of people like Dr. He Wei and Dr. Chu Dong Yu, who was then very powerful, and he managed to get a large sum of government money to encourage proper quality, high quality seed data production. And this included subsidies for those who would make the capital investments and included subsidies for those who would buy the mini tubers, say paying, paying one third, the price would be subsidized and two thirds would, would be paid by the buyer but all ways to encourage better quality seed being produced by farmers all across China. As you know, China is by far the largest potato producer in the world today. And a lot of that is thanks to what's just I'm showing you here with the great impetus on improving the technology for growing high quality, virus-free, disease-free mini tubers. So here's a picture of a, of a setup that was built, probably one or two hectares in size, huge, Facilities were built, and these were built for uh, to do aeroponics. This is just the interior of the of the facility, basically copying what Sichuan had done at the academy had done, only on a large commercial scale, producing millions of tubers for different programs across uh, Sichuan and beyond. And this took a lot of work. And her way, who's shown in the picture here on the, on the left was the advisor for this company. And the young guy to my, to my left is the, the manager of this facility, doing this kind of work together to uh, have success as far as high capital investment, proper equipment, and then proper technology to produce the crop. And this way it could move forward. And this was done by many people across China, from North China along West, into Western China. I would call this the, the, real, the, the real launch of the program of aeroponics for mini tuber production for G0, G1 seed production. 
But we saw many problems taking place. These, there were, I would say 30 or 40 large setups built and more were being built, but there were challenges. So in 2015, Fe Kayun and her way and myself, we organized a workshop. And this workshop was really meant for active participants, technicians who worked on aeroponics in the different greenhouse facilities. This was held in Shendu. About 70 participants came from China, from India, and myself and Andre Lachance from Canada. And at that workshop, we had a tremendous amount of camaraderie amongst ourselves, of course. But more than that, we, 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 we had uh, great field trips to greenhouses of different companies, as well as to the research facilities. We had lectures, discussion groups, and uh, it was both in English and Chinese. We had translation work being done. And here in the picture, you can see uh, Andre Lachance with the gray hair and Kayun sitting beside him and myself up at the back, at the back row here. But anyway, the point is we had very good discussions and it was an extremely valuable event to help all of the doers do their jobs better and to learn together how to do this well. So it was very timely and Che Kayun was the key motivator behind this. I want to highlight Andre Lachance. Andre, uh, a colleague who I've worked with for many years, he asked me about aeroponics and, and he went to Shendu. I'm not sure if around 2010 or so, he went to Shendu or 2011 to study with, uh, with her way in Wonkishu about aeroponics. And Andre went back to Quebec and he started his own facility with his company. And Andre has been, uh, not only did, was he a great student uh, in China, but also then he became a student at the Laval University working as a researcher with other people there to really understand how aeroponics worked under the conditions of Canada with the varieties we grow in North America to really help make him do it right. And then after that, he developed with his company, their own aeroponics greenhouse facility. And this is, a, a, I would say, an ultra modern facility that Andre has built with uh, all the bells and whistles that you can imagine, but it still uh, has been proven to be so economically feasible and profitable for him to grow his mini tubers in this way. And here's just a picture of showing the, uh, the picture of the plants growing. He has lots of, lots of space in there. Andre's spacing is a bit further apart than most, and he gets probably well over 100 tubers per plant. And you see these tubes on the top of the picture on the right, that's where he adds extra carbon dioxide into the foliage to get more growth, more, more photosynthesis. So he's really developed very high technology level for his production and it's done very well. Back in Sichuan, here's a photo of the researchers that work uh, at the academy there. The front row, Wang Keshu is in the middle. She and her way who's, sitting, who's standing behind her, plus their colleagues work together to do the research work and to train people to uh, improve technologies. And with them, I've been very fortunate to collaborate over the years doing different research projects with graduate students. And uh, this way, we're defining the technology and improving what can be done both at the research level, but also at the commercial level. So I'm very, very indebted to these six colleagues for their work and uh, what they've done as far as collaborating with many people, including Andre Lachance in Quebec has been wonderful. So just to give a basic overview of what aeroponics is all about. First of all, let me look at the, this picture on the right. That's a very simplified diagram of an aeroponics setup. You have to have a, 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 a nutrient solution container or tank. You have pipes with a, a pump that pumps the solution through the boxes where the plants are growing. And it, the nozzles spray the solution every so many, so many seconds, every so many minutes depending on what you want. And that way the plants are nourished. The solution that's all recycled, there's nothing lost, it's filtered. Uh, periodically the solution is, has to be adjusted for different nutrients and electrical conductivity. And this is all part of the art of how to do your aeroponics successful. 
Now, coupled with that basic aeroponic setup is your climatic conditions. And the right, at the left side, we have a, a graph showing solar radiation data, day length data, and temperature data. Now, potato plants are very much sensitive to photosynthesis, to, to photoperiod. The solar radiation, of course, is a big factor for productivity of the crop. So how do you time and maximize the use of your facilities by growing, in this case, Shindu, they can grow two crops per year, a spring crop going into longer days and an autumn crop going into shorter days. The spring crop has more solar radiation, expect higher yields. The fall crop goes, decreases. Certain varieties are better adapted to long days, others are better adapted to short days. So you have to look at the geographic constraints of your own area to decide what season is best for each variety that you're working with. And then you can manipulate that further through different physiological manipulations. I'll get that to that in a minute. So every environment, whether it's in Quebec or in Northern latitudes, you have this. If you get to places like Kenya or Ethiopia at the equator or Indonesia, you're lucky you have more of a stable photo period all year round and other conditions are more uniform as well. So you can have more flexibility in how you manage your system. But the Northern latitudes definitely create two seasons that are very much contrasting seasons. So how do we start the aeroponic system? So basically we work with, with, with um, in vitro plants. And those in vitro plants from district culture can go directly into the aeroponic system or you can put them into a hydroponic bed. This is a hydroponic bed where the plants are placed in uh, through little holes and the solution underneath flows is about maybe one inch thick. That solution flows through there and that nourishes the plants and they grow for two or three weeks like that. And then you can either transplant the whole hydroponic plant to the aeroponic box or you can cut them at the base and remove the roots which is much easier because the roots have grown so big already in the hydroponic system that it's harder to get them out. So all three are options. All three have been studied. Again, depending on the variety, each one performs it differently with how you manipulate it. So hydroponics is used as a starting point in some cases. Now just an example, here's a picture of, of four varieties grown with Hydroponic plants with, with roots, yes, and without roots, no. And you can see after 56 days that the difference is very, virtually there's no difference. So this, these plants root quickly and, and root well under the conditions of uh, the aeroponic system. Just to back up one minute, I wanna just stress one point here. In all three of these cases, whether it's in vitro plants, hydroponic plants with roots or without roots, the juvenile leaf stage is important. If the leaves become compound, you'll see all these leaves in this picture are simple rounded leaves. If the leaves become compound, then the physiological age of that plant is too old and it will not develop properly. So the juvenile stage is imperative to be successful in hydroponics to get a large tuber set. Now we've done a lot of experiments at the Sichuan with graduate students like Wong Kekun here in the picture. She did her master's degree on working with hormones and uh, with gibberellic acid, it was with uh, anti gibberellins to study how these affected different varieties during the two growing seasons, going into long days and going into short days. And of course, it's very different. You can see the detrimental effect in this picture on the right of, of uh, Certain treatments are, are very detrimental. Other treatments are very beneficial. So um, we learned through this process what possible manipulations and hormones you can use. Now, some operations say we don't want to use any hormones because of the, 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 the residual effect it'll have on the tubers in the coming growing season when they're growing in the field. And these are very, very, very valid reasons. If you can manipulate it through managing your nitrogen levels, nitrogen shocks, you can also manipulate how the plants grow. So there's different ways for different operators and each, have, each has their own reasons for what they do. And of course, every operation will have its own, I would call secrets as to how they do their business. And that's perfectly expected. For myself, I'm, I'm not directly 
it's not my business. So I can speak about various people's operations and what they do. So I'm, I guess I'm in that sense, I'm neutral. Tuber quality has been one of the biggest issues discussed with aeroponics. Are the tubers of any, are the quality of tubers growing in aeroponics as good as those grown in substrate in a soil media or in a, in a, in a greenhouse mixture? And many say, no, they're not as good. And this has been a, I won't say, it hasn't been really clearly, it's, it's sort of a, I won't say it's a myth, but it's discussed and there's two sides of the coin. But one of the factors that affect aeroponic tuber quality is the, the oxygen levels in the boxes during the growing season. Now here we have three varieties, Mira, Favorita, and this variety from Peru, uh, developed from Peru, that show different tubers growing under the same conditions. Now the Favorita tuber you can see has very, very smooth skin, very much, very firm. Mira is intermediate, but look at the, the 117 at the bottom here. The lenticels in that tuber were very large. These lenticels were large because it, the, that variety felt like the oxygen level in the tank was not enough. It was so wet in there that the oxygen levels were not enough and therefore you have large litter cells. You it's like your mouth is breathing for oxygen and therefore you have dehydration of the tumor. So these have lost a lot of vigor. And this is the problem you can experience. So we have to manage this properly. Sometimes we've added oxygen into the tanks, the boxes to improve this, to reduce the litter cell size. But more important also is this, once you harvest the tubers, you have to properly superize them. Superization for two weeks at, a, at high humidity at 14 degrees Celsius is so important to really help cure the skin. And then after that, you can, must bring them down to uh, four degrees Celsius in cold storage because with aeroponics, you keep harvesting every two weeks, you harvest tubers. So to keep the physiological aids more uniform, you got to store them at four degrees Celsius to keep the chronological age is not the same, but the physiological age remains the same or close to the same. But these are challenges you face. And again, it's variety specific as this slide shows. So growing aeroponically grown tuber, many tubers. Generally speaking, the, the, the size, preferred size to plant are 10 grams or bigger. Five to 10 gram tubers can also be planted. And three to five gram tubers are really on the small side and they would be maybe planted in greenhouses or depending on the conditions of the field. Here's a picture from Quebec showing many tubers that have sprouted very nicely in this planter where each person puts a, they place tubers into the, into the pie shapes thing that circulates and drops the potatoes into the ground. This system is very um, simple. This is a precision planter. You can control the depth of planting and ideal system for growing potatoes from many tubers, whether they're from aeroponics or any other system. And this is a crop growing and you can just picture, I just wanna show a couple of things in this picture. <clears throat> you can see that the, the one, the, the, there's a blank row that's between varieties in Canada, you have to have that for certification purposes. This row that's kind of small plants are the smallest mini tubers. And the ones beside that that are larger had larger mini tubers. So there is a, definitely a vigor effect uh, correlated with seed size. So this is, uh, you have to be aware of this. And the bigger the tuber, I mean, 10 grams and up, you have a good, a good, a good crop. Smaller tubers, you have to manage them more carefully to make sure you get the same yield potential. This picture is from Quebec. Here's a picture from North China with the variety Shepherdy, which many of you know from Canada. These are again, two a double row beds with a uh, uh, drip irrigation line down the middle of the two, the two on, on top of the bed. And this way, here they're growing many tubers in the field on a large scale with drip irrigation, properly managed and getting a beautiful crop with these small aeroponically grown mini tubers. Let me take you to a uh, commercial business. Mr. Gao Jian, who's the gentleman here in the picture on the left. He's a university graduate, Yunnan University. He um, started a business. He actually he started with some partners and he grew his business and grew his business. And uh, presently he's selling 6 million mini tubers annually. Get this, 6 million, that's his business. Besides that, he does other 
businesses as well with flowers and other fruits and, 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 and as well, like strawberries. So he has an amazing business. These are his technicians with him on the one picture and all his staff, not even not all his staff, but some of his staff on the other picture who do the work in the, in the tissue culture laboratory and in the greenhouses. Now, God, John has been a very wonderful to cooperate with, and he has been very open to share his problems and his successes. What he has done has been very unique. He has developed what I would call the A-frame system, where you see the sloping beds. Rather than boxes, he has this on a sloping A-frame. And this, uh, he finds this has, makes better use of space and light. And it has advantages and also has disadvantages. The key thing for potato production is that you need to have darkness inside the box or inside the A-frame. So the stolons that are produced will produce tubers and not a new shoot. So lighting is a very big factor that needs to be considered. But again, it, it's very doable and, he, and his system is dual purpose. He can, he can do other crops with this system as well. Very fortunate and a very unique system that others have tried to copy. Some have done it successfully, others have not done so. But uh, I asked Gao Zhang, would you do this again? And he said, he said, depending on what his objective is, if it's only for potatoes, he would not do this again. So that's maybe a good clue for those who are thinking about this. If you want to make it multi-purpose, yes. If not, the box system, like I showed you with Andre Lachance, for example, is better. And this just shows you his production. This is his inside the A-frame, the many tubers being produced on the plants. And then his room where he does the superization, where he keeps them, keeps them warm for two weeks at high humidity. And then he stores them in a cold storage room. And he has many of these rooms. And these 6 million tubers are sold by order across China. And uh, he grows basically on orders that he gets from customers. That's the way it works. <clears throat> Most operations in China are much smaller. And I don't know if any operation anywhere in the world that would be of, of, of this size at this point in time. I'm happy to, if, if somebody has more than 6 million tubers a year, please let me know. I'd be curious to see, hear about it. What are the significant learnings we've, that I want to share with you today? We've been doing this now for 12, 13 years. And um, I just want to highlight a few of the points that her way and Wong Keshu and I have want to share. The two seasons are very contrasting in northern latitudes, the spring versus the autumn season. Cold short days going to hot long days in the spring and the reverse in the fall. Now the variety types are also very important to consider because the varieties that we that grow in the traditionally in the north, like the favorita or the shepherdy, respond very differently than the varieties that come from Peru, from the equator. Those are the indigenous types. So again, we have to learn how to manage these. In Southern China, a lot of the indigenous varieties are being grown, manage them differently. Managing gibberellic acid is a big consideration. Whether it works good or not works good depends on the variety and the season. And same goes for anti-gibberellins. Uniconazole is the most commonly used one in China but others are, are, that can do the same thing can also help promote tuberization under hot conditions. We do know from most places that solution temperature must remain between 16 and 18 degrees Celsius. If it gets too hot, it gets too warm in the box, you don't get good tuberization. If it's too cold, it, things grow too slowly. So that's sort of a norm. You can decide what's is best, but Normally we have a thermost, a, a way to control the temperature of the solution to keep it in this very specific range. We need to adjust the nutrient solution to feed the plants based on the physiological stage the plant is in. And this requires understanding of not only the, the, the basic, all the elements involved in, 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 in nutrition. And nitrogen level is probably the most important, both the levels, how much you give when, and also the shock treatment of when you don't give any to stimulate tuberization. Lintus cell size is a big issue, which I already showed you. And some cultivars are more susceptible to low oxygen levels than others. This is a very big factor for the next generation when you grow them in the field to have the good, firm seed pieces that will grow with vigorous. 
adding CO2 to the foliage has shown to improve production. And people have experimented with this. And I think it's going to get more and more popular as we learn more about how to do this properly. The physiological age of the tuber. Because you harvest chronologically every two weeks, you harvest them like you harvest apples from an apple tree. You harvest potatoes every two weeks. When they're a certain size, you pick the tubers off so new tubers can grow on the plants. And this, so the physiological age needs to be kept as uniform as possible through the two week subrization period, followed by immediate storing at four degrees Celsius when the growing degree days or the, the, the physiological aging process basically considered to be zero. So that's very important, the subrization plus cold storage. Now for me, when I visit aeroponics systems, the biggest challenge I've seen around the world, this is in, in Africa and part, parts of Asia and South America, is hygiene and cleanliness. It's so hard to get, so hard to have pathogen-free solution and pathogen-free conditions in those boxes. And for me, when I look at, open the box and look inside, are the roots white? If they have white roots, you know you have a clean system. If the roots are not white, brown or dark colored, you know you have some pathogens that are giving, handicapping the growth of that plant. And the other thing that's very important is monitoring your system. Electricity failures are devastating. Even for, if the electricity goes off for too long a period of time and the generators don't kick in right away, you can lose your whole crop. So this is a very important factor in anybody considering a new operation that the monitoring is done right, the generators are in place to kick in, the power goes out, and this is indispensable. Final words from Dr. Hewe. Hewe has been a great partner to work with, and he has three things he wants to share with us today. Successful aeroponic operations require dedicated and serious technicians to be successful and fully utilize the benefits. And I've already talked about that, even the white roots. If, you, if the roots aren't white, the technician has to do better. Then the good news is that Dr. Hoe wants to host another international workshop on aeroponics in October, 2022. That's the plan in Chengdu. So if all those who are interested can come and see what's being done in China, both at the research level and the commercial level, that's the plan October or maybe November of 2022, we'll have this event. And the World Planet Congress will be a participant in hosting this event. And uh, this is going to be a major way that we can really, again, further improve on the technology and learn from each other to do this better for the benefit of improving potato production around the world. So th this comes to my last slide here that um, I have listed all the four, four there's four of us here listed, myself, Wong Ke Shu, Her Wei, and Henri Lachance. And all four of us have agreed that we can be recipients of questions, emails, regarding whatever questions you may have. So if you want to ask a specific question to Wong Ke Shu, please ask her or Her Wei, ask, ask him, Andre or myself. And we'll be happy to answer as best we can whatever questions you may have. Because this is an exciting field. It's really developing still. And uh, we look forward to collaborating with all those who are exploring this option for their seed production business in their countries. So with that, I want to give you thanks. And I want to thank also all our sponsors. We're so fortunate with uh, the World Planet Congress to have a whole host of different sponsors who sustain us as an organization. We're a voluntary organization, yet there are costs involved in operating an organization. And these are all players who support us. And if your organizations also would like to be involved in supporting us, we welcome that. And we have different levels of supporting from platinum to gold to silver. And uh, recognition is given to all those who do this. And we give you thanks for, we thank these sponsors for making this event even possible. So with that, I want to close the presentation out. And then I think Nora will handle with me the questions that are going to come from you. <clears throat> Thank you.
So Peter, you can show your screen, your video now. Do I, does it show? Yeah, yes, I can see you fine. Do you want to look on the q and A? I I think you're getting questions in there. Oh yeah, I see them already. <clears throat> Am I showing on the, as big per, uh, on the whole screen or not? Yes, you are. Okay, perfect, okay. <clears throat> okay. So do you see that first question, Peter, on have you looked at tuber dormancy? Oh, no, no I, okay. Yes, okay, thank you. thanks for the question on dormancy. I talked about in my presentation about physiological age versus chronological age. And this is a big, the big challenge. And we're doing some experiments right now actually on this very topic. We've been harvesting potatoes uh, every two weeks. They're all superized for two weeks and stored in cold storage for two, stored in cold storage. We'll plant them all the same time as different treatments. So each harvest will have a different, the different harvest dates will all be planted as treatments and the same experiment. Uh, generally, we find that if you store them at four degrees Celsius, you have very, very normal kind of dormancy and uh, sprouting taking place. So if a variety has a three month dormancy, it's normally about three months. But again, I, it, this goes back to the, the, the temperature of the solution. The same temperature is above 18 degrees Celsius, you will stimulate sprouting faster, much faster. So we have to be very careful about that. And if it's too cold, generally the plants grow too slowly. So the main issue is really the solution temperature to be in that ballpark of 16, 17, 18 degrees Celsius. And that has to be controlled. There's a question here about doses. I'm not sure if I understand it exactly. Um, the, the, the key here is that I think every variety, every variety responds differently. And the, the, the rates of different nutrients in the solution has to be learned both for the variety and for the growing part of the growing season that it's in. So I can't give you a cookbook answer. You have to learn that for your own varieties. There's, a, there's enough publications out to show you the general rules, but from there you have to learn how to manage each one separately based on your own growing season conditions and the variety. I gave a webinar, the, the second webinar we did in 2019 on geographic constraints to potato production. And it talked about temperature and photoperiod conditions in that, uh, in, that, in that presentation. That presentation is good to look at because that gives you an overview of the geographic constraints that deal with how to manage plants, whether it's in soil or in an aeroponic system. It doesn't matter. Nora, do you have a next question? I don't, don't oh, here's the one here. Oh. Yeah, solution temperature is very important. And I, uh, we've, what we found is that, uh, for example, in Sichuan, if by June, the temperature of the solution will be up to well into the 20s without having um, a cooling system to cool the solution down. And then you really hurt the plants and you'll start, the plants will start to have second growth and sprouting and you have a complete mess. So Peter, I don't know if you can see some of these other ones, but you have yeah, a lot of questions. But um, one question <laughs> is um, the, the advantages of the aeroponics versus hydroponics. You know, with aeroponics, like I mentioned, on real chance, probably averages 125 tubers per plant. There's no way you can get that with any other system. And I think that's, to me, the advantage with aeroponics is the large numbers you can produce. If you start with the plants being with simple rounded leaves, if the leaves get compound leaves, you won't be successful. And I think this is the most important single factor that gives the advantage to growing plants in, in, under aeroponics is getting such large numbers of tubers per in vitro plant going into it. With the hydroponic plants, you can actually harvest them also several times. You can take first cutting, second cutting, and third cutting from a hydroponic plant. And that way you, again, increase your numbers 
of, of plants from one in vitro plant. So again, you can make efficiency by taking, just simply taking cuttings and then letting them root in the hydroponic system. The nutrient solution, I see some questions here about nutrient solution. And I think the main thing is that electrical conductivity will change if you don't refresh your solution often enough. It will become, it will have negative effects. So pH and electrical conductivity are very important to manage and to measure frequently and to replenish the solution as needed. The one comment is that with aeroponics, if you have electricity failure, you're in trouble. In hydroponics, you're not. This is very true, but that's why I'm saying you don't even start aeroponics without having a generator backup. Don't even think about it. If you don't have a generator to back up your electricity, don't do it. Because if you don't have that, you're, you're destined to have power failure, even in, no matter what country in the world you live in, you'll have power failure. And if it's too long, even an hour or two hours, you'll have significant negative effects. I don't know if you can pull up the Q&A. Yeah, I see there's so many. <laughs> there's a lot. <laughs> I know, I don't know. Uh, you want me to help pick some? Yeah, pick some that you think are the best, yeah. Okay, how about, um, how can you control pathogens within the solutions? Okay, uh, uh, you know, when I, uh, when I go to Andre Lachance's place, the first thing I do when I walk, I see when I walk into his aeroponics, um, first, the first room before you get into the greenhouse are all the different um, chemicals that he uses to keep his solution clean. When I go to, to, uh, to Wong Keshu's greenhouses in Shindu, it's the same thing. And they have different pathogen, manage, manage different pathogens with different chemicals and they have their secrets, how it works. It's very important. You have to add a little bit of this, a little bit of that. And of course, a good filter system too. And a very tight closed system as far as no contamination from the outside getting in. So what are the doses for the CO2 application on the foliage? <laughs> You know, there's a lot of different, again, it's, I think what Andre would say that it's not a refined technology yet, but I'm sure you can go to at least a thousand parts per million. Right now, the, the air is around 400. You can double that at least and you'll see great benefit. And in fact, there's more benefits from CO2 addition even to the bottom of the plant that we haven't even explored yet. So there's a, there's a huge frontier there. Uh, with CO2 additions to the to both the foliage as well as even below the tuberization area. So this is to me is very exciting and uh, easy easy to easy to do, but still not well understood as to how much you need and the impact. So another question is that is it constant misting with aeroponics or is it intermittent? Generally speaking, the misting system is intermittent. You may mist for 10 seconds every three minutes or 20 seconds every, every three, four minutes. The, again, it depends on you, what your system can handle and what you see works best under your conditions. So there's different ways of doing it, but it's, always, it's almost always intermittent. If it's if continuous, it's too wet in there. So there's a couple questions. I think there's a lot of curiosity and intrigued about, about the vertical aeroponics. Is that the future or maybe expand a little bit on that? Okay, the A-frame, you know, it looks great, right? And Gao Jian says it, it works, it works good for him. But he says if he did it again for potatoes only, he would not do it. And it's the, the problem is when you don't have when you get light inside the box or inside the A-frame, you your 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 stolen tips will turn green and can keep growing to try to produce a new plant, a new, a new stem. And you don't want, you want that stolen tip to produce, to stop growing longitudinally and to develop laterally to break a tuber. And that's the biggest issue with keeping it dark inside. Uh, as far as the, the, you see the plants in the A-frame, the bottom plants are too close to the ground and the top plants are up nice and high. If you look at Andre's, Andre's boxes, you, it's, it's sort of at 
waist level to above your head. So it's easier to pick the tubers out of the box as well. So I would say that A-frame has to be, if you're multi-purpose, yes. Otherwise, don't do it. Great. I think there's also a question on the, is there a relationship between plant maturity and number of tubers you get in aeroponics? Well, that, that's the, the juvenile, I keep, I want to keep saying that over again. The juvenile leaf stage is important. It's, it's, it's the basic. If a potato plant has compound leaves, you're done. Okay. And we found that you can harvest cuttings. Like I mentioned, we did an experiment just recently in, in Shindu where we harvest cuttings for two, three times from the same in vitro plant growing in hydroponics. And they all did equally well or virtually equally well. So there's no negative effect as long as the leaves remain in the juvenile, simple, rounded leaf stage. That's the beauty of it. So another question is, what is the minimum weight of a healthy mini tuber? <laughs> that depends on your conditions. If you look at, if you have very nice soil with nice loamy soil with no lumps, you can probably go down to three grams. But really, most people don't want anything less than five, and most people prefer over 10. So that's, I say 10 grams and up is ideal. And below that, you have to have special management, drip irrigation systems, whatever it takes to get the plants to grow properly. Another question is, how do you have continuous um, harvest without damaging the plant or damaging other tubers around it? That's a good question. Actually, you have to be very careful. <laughs> the A-frame actually is quite nice that way because you can walk right down the middle and you can just pick them off like apples from an apple tree, right? Uh, in the box, it's a bit more tricky because you got to reach inside to get them, the ones that are across the other side of the box. And uh, But it's doable, it, but you have to be careful. You're right. You can, you can definitely twist some stolons up and break some stolons and break some roots. And you have to, be set, you have, to have your hands clean too because you don't want to contaminate the inside of the box. But generally every two weeks they go in and harvest all tubers that are larger than a certain size, whether it's five grams, your, your limb minimum, or whatever you pick as your minimum, you go in there and eyeball them and pick those tubers out carefully. And then you wait for the, the last batches, the big harvest is at the end, of course, when you take to clean it out and even the small ones are harvested. And the, the very small ones like less than three grams could be even planted in a greenhouse substrate to produce a new crop as well. There's some questions about cost, and then if you want to make some comments about that at all. The cost thing is a very interesting question because, you know, most of these facilities in China were built with very high quality greenhouses. I mean, I would call them like the European style greenhouses. And those costs may be high, but at the end of the day, they have longevity and they produce the, the return on the investment, I assure is better than buy, building a cheap greenhouse or having a plastic one that with time the, the light entry is reduced and therefore you have less photosynthesis potential as well. So again, I think you have to pencil it out. Gao Jiang could tell you what it costs him to produce a mini tuber. Andre can tell you what it costs him to produce a mini tuber. And it's all, the cost includes the, the amortization of your facilities, your capital investments. But these guys make it work. So clearly they've made it work, but you have to be very efficient. And it would be very different from Peru compared to uh, East Africa, compared to China or Canada too. I think there's some questions about ozone and using ozone to manage um, pathogen. Is, do you have any experience or comments about that? I don't have any experience with the ozone. No, I don't, sorry. <clears throat> um, the one question here I see is about whether this technology will be used, will be widely adopted in, in Europe and in North America. And I, you know, I, I don't see it taking off very fast. I mean, in Canada, we have, I would say, two places where aeroponics is being used on a commercial scale. And that's it. And so it's kind of surprising it hasn't spread further. Whereas in China, I think the labor costs also are a factor and efficiency of, of, efficiency of how to make a system work with the, the labor costs being what they are in North America. So generally here we do more generations uh, in the field. We have like Whereas in China, they want to have only three generations in the field in total. That's what they, so they have a much higher demand for the first generation to be a large number and multiply it fewer times because of soil pathogen problems. And that's what the case is in most of the developing world where you have bacterial wilt problems too. 
So that's why you see the, in North America, we have better control, I think, of the first, second, third, and fourth generation in the field. So we can multiply more that way. <clears throat> Um, I think there's other questions about maybe what nutrient you think is stimulating tuber initiation the most. Well, the, new, the tuber initiation stimulation is going to be based on day length, temperature, uh, nitrogen levels, and whether you whether you will use any kind of hormone to uh, to either reduce the the, the the just to reduce the foliar growth or not. So I think this is not, not an easy question to answer. Again, it's variety specific and growing season specific. Um, what about, think, there's some questions I think about um, just kind of plant growth regulators, specifically GA. Uh, there's also some questions about using maybe cytokinins or auxins, maybe just discuss that a little bit. And I think they were wondering exactly when are these applied during this process. So normally what we do, and as I said, some growers refuse to use any hormones because they feel that the, the hormones applied to the plants during this, the first, during the growing season of aeroponics will affect the tuber quality when planted in the fields. And some like Gao Jan refuses to use any hormones. He's, that's out of the question for him. So he manages his crop by variety, by daily, by season, as well as by nitrogen management. So what we've done in our experiments is you, in what commercially you can do, you spray on the GA whenever you think, it, GA generally you spray on early in the spring to get enough growth when it's still cold. Or in the fall, when the days get too short, you wanna stimulate growth. So you add a little bit of GA to stimulate foliar growth. And cytokinins and ABA can also be used. New, new, uh, uniconazole as an antigebrelic can also be used. And these are sprayed foliar on the plant at a, at a, a low dosage of five to 10 parts per million, based on what you think is best. Um, intermittently every 10 days, or maybe just once, depends on your variety again and your conditions. There are some questions about the fabric um, that is used. Do you want to make some comments about that? Oh, <clears throat> the fabric for the the fabric for the greenhouses itself or fabric for the inside the box? Inside the box. Inside the box. So we've done some experiments with keeping, if the solution in the box gets too wet, actually Sheikh Ayun was the key guy behind this. He would put a, a netting in the bottom above the, in the box, of, say two thirds of the way down. So roots could go through the netting into the solute, whatever was sitting there as solution in the misting. Two was would stay above the netting. I don't think there's anything special about the netting used. Whatever is commercially, locally available and cheap is what would be used. So others say that if you have to do that, you have your, your, your system is too wet and the sloping of the floor is not good enough to get rid of the solution fast enough from after the misting is stopped for those few minutes between, between misting periods. One other question was about maybe reusing the fertigation water. Is there any threat or concerns with that? Well, that's why I go, I, the picture I showed you, it goes through all the, it's all recycled. It goes right back in. And then the solution is either re replenished with adjustments for electroconductivity and pH, or you, after a week, you can throw the solution out, whatever's left, and replenish with a, start the system over again with a new solution. So that's, there's several ways of doing this, but uh, it's all filtered and there's really no waste because it's all recycled during the, the period that you use that specific solution, which can be up to a week at least. Um, what other crops are suitable to produce in the same aeroponic boxes when the potato season is over? Uh, good question. <clears throat> well, you can grow any kind of uh, lettuce or or strawberries or those all can grow on with where you harvest it, what's on top right those are all doable crops and flowers too and that's what they're doing in fact with Gao John's business he has all these other crops that he does as well and uh, so but you don't really use what's in the box you use what's above the box the, What about um, planting density plants per square meter? Any comments on that? Okay, so this again, I think goes back to the labor cost. 
In Canada, the, the spacing is further apart because labor costs are higher, and you don't you use only and you don't multiply your plants from as cuttings. So you have wider spacing, and you have you get more tubers per plant. Uh, in other countries, they do closer spacing with say, and then you have higher density, so you have fewer tubers per plant, but tubers per square meter would be equal to that. So again, there's pros and cons to both ways, but I think it really comes down to the cost of what your what is the cost of producing your in vitro plants, your hydroponic plants, how often do you can you cut them if you if you do it at all, and what is your labor cost to balance all this out. So that's that's it's again a complicated question depending on where you live. <clears throat> Another question is, um, is aeroponic mini tuber production suitable for organic farming? <laughs> well, it depends how you define organic farming, I guess, because you definitely the solution, you know, this goes back to, I reminded of my days uh, when I worked in Vietnam back in the early 80s. There they use coconut milk, plus some other natural substances to grow their tissue culture plants. And you know, coconut milk actually is a very good nutritious uh, drink, not only for humans, but also for plants. So I, I see it very difficult to, uh, to be organic with adding chemicals like nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, et cetera, from bottles that you buy from a chemical store. It can't be considered organic as such, but if you use coconut milk and other nutrients like that, you could make it that way, but I would say that it's not possible. <clears throat> Um, what do you think about apical rooted cuttings? Could they be an alternative to aeroponics? I'm very happy for that question because this is really, I think this is the alternative. Now, if I think of what Monica Parker is doing with many people now in East Africa, where local people at the village level can do the apical rooted cuttings so well, or what's happening now in India, in the remote parts of India, and in different states. Again, this is so simple actually to have only a few in vitro plants, make the mother plants, take cuttings, multiply them, root them, and then ultimately transplant them to the field or transplant to the greenhouse to produce many tubers. To me, if, if, you, if your conditions are somewhat primitive and you lack uh, uh, nutrition as far as uh, proper sourcing of nutritional uh, of inputs, plus electricity is a problem and water is a problem, I would not recommend aeroponics. It requires high tech, sophisticated. What her way said in his little closing remarks is exactly correct. You need the right conditions with dedicated people, otherwise it won't work. Otherwise you'll have failure. So there's room for both, a big room for both. And I the April cutting revolution that's taking place in India and in East Africa is truly wonderful and amazing. And I endorse both, by the way. <laughs> Well, Peter, I think we're coming up on the hour. You could probably answer questions for the next five hours. Um, so. <laughs> no, I, yeah. no, I, I appreciate all the interest. It's great to see all these questions. I, I mean, I, I can only see about four questions at a time, but I just keep scrolling through the whole list. So uh, I appreciate everybody's interest. And as I said, we have our emails on the last second last slide. And if you have any real detailed questions, I know some of you are going to start aeroponics in your countries. Please feel free to ask us for advice or to who we should suggest you consult. We'd be happy to assist in any way possible. And then forget, don't forget we're going to have this international workshop in October 2022. You're welcome to come that as well. And that will be a great place for learning and cross-pollination amongst all the players who are doing it and who those who are really interested in doing it as well. So with that, I want to thank you all for your great interest and support of participating in this workshop. And it's been a pleasure for me to share what I've learned as the old guy now with uh, having watched what's happened over the last years, it's been great to see the evolution. And um, I'm privileged to be part of it. So thank you very much. And